From the Virginia Audio Collective at WTJU 91.1 FM and Brown College at the University of Virginia, this is Circle of Willis, human stories of the science that shapes our world. We can meet the challenges, uh, many challenges, but um, when they become chronic, then they then damage occurs, and what you have is premature disease of pathology of, of many, many kinds, and the question is, who, who dies of what? Welcome back to Circle of Willis. I'm your host, Jim Cohn, and I am once again joined by our producer, Sage Tangway. That was a pretty dire-sounding clip we just played. Well, this was a pretty intense conversation in terms of implications. When I was reviewing this audio, it felt like I was having the experience of starting out at a microscopic level, and then the information our guest shares sort of blows that perspective all the way out to these mammoth, complex concepts about society and environment. What can you tell me about Peter Sterling? Well, I I can tell you that Peter Sterling is one of our greatest and most celebrated uh, neuroscientists. He's been on the faculty of the neuroscience department at the University of Pennsylvania for decades, where he's taught us all about everything from the eyeball and how the eye is connected to the brain and how eyes work, vision works, to the way that all organisms throughout the history of the planet are organized to efficiently explore the world and extract resources from it while they make babies. So there's there's a lot in between those two uh, levels, right? This is not a guy who stays stuck in a very narrow band. He sees things for their implications, not just as they are. Often you begin these conversations kind of chronologically talking about the researcher's life and how that brought them to what they study in their professional lives. But this one just starts with the science. And I was prepared to switch everything around to follow that that typical format. But honestly, in this case, I think there's really something to starting with the science. Even if it didn't come first into his life, it feels essential to understanding him as a person and a professional. Yeah, I agree. One of the things that informs all of this work is his life as a communist, which, I mean, that sounds so uh, anachronistic now. It sounds like it's completely out of time. But he's someone that we, we used to call a red diaper baby, which means that his parents were members of the Communist Party. And what that meant for him was not supporting the Soviet Union or, you know, something like that. What it meant for him was worrying about people who were suffering, who were disadvantaged, who were discriminated against. And all of that has informed his scientific work. For, for people like Peter Sterling, and especially for Peter Sterling himself, his science, his worldview, the things that are important to him, the things that speak to his values, these are all braided together. They're not separate compartments. And I think there's a lot to learn from that, both personally as a scientist myself and as a a society that is based on technology and science as much as it is. So this will be a two-part episode, but I urge you listening, don't skip out on any of it. This conversation is like an Ouroboros, the giant mythical serpent winding around to eat its own tail. Let's take a listen. I was once interviewed by Terry Gross a very, Were you really? very yeah, a very long time ago. When she before she was national. Before she was away. Terry Gross. Yeah. She, How'd it go? She, you know, I have a recording and I never listened to it because I feel like it was just terrible. Oh, <laughs> it really? probably wasn't as bad. But I was it was early days on about psychosurgery and stuff like that that I was working on and I I was too uh timid really about condemning it and speaking clearly and and uh, it, it was probably all right but I never felt good about it so I guess one of the things I w- wanted to start with is even though it's been around for a while 
it's still kind of new for a, a lot of folks. What is allostasis? Sure. Well, allostasis is a concept of how the body uh, is regulated uh, physiologically. We have a certain heartbeat. We have a certain concentration of salt in our in our blood, which is regulated by the kidney. We have a myriad, thousands and thousands of parameters that have to be regulated to within fairly precise limits or, or something goes wrong. If, if our blood sugar falls too far, the first thing that happens is that uh, our brain uh, requires glucose from the blood or we go unconscious. So we need a certain blood pressure, uh, certain levels of calcium, and all, all manner of, of uh, different parameters that have to be regulated. The concept that was established uh, early by a French physiologist said that uh, basically the condition uh, for for life was to have everything constant. I remember hearing this in, in a lecture when I was uh, in, in college in biology that uh, Claude Bernard had said this this is the requirement, and the professor who was wonderful uh, quoted it in French and. I, I thought this was very interesting, and the point was it happens automatically. And this theme of regulation holding things constant by the body having mechanisms to regulate it, I found fascinating. It's called homeostasis. That is, yeah. you hold things constant by automatic regulation, and the analogy is to a thermostat. If the room gets too warm, it turns the furnace off and the air conditioning on, if it gets too cold, it turns the furnace up, and this right. happens automatically. Take a salamander, you know, out in in the in the woods here in in the Blue Ridge Mountains. The salamander likes a cold, dark, damp space where hopefully there's some bugs. And if it goes out of that space, it has it mounts a stress response, and the stress response is for the purpose of getting it back to that space. Yeah. So there are these corrective responses that the body initiates, it doesn't particularly have anything to do with the brain. I was fine with this until uh, the early 1970s when I began thinking about how society affects the body, which it does, and and that must yeah. be mediated by the brain. And so I, with, a, with a, uh, another young biologist, Joseph Iyer, at the University of Pennsylvania, we we began sort of looking at actually how how are things regulated, and so we we found, in fact, the brain sends uh, nerve fibers to the various peripheral organs, for example, to the endocrine cells in the kidney. It sends nerve fibers to insulin secreting cells in the pancreas. It, it sends nerve fibers to every blood vessel. Every one of our blood vessels is innervated. Through the by, by the central nervous system by, by the brain. Well, by by there's a peripheral part of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous yeah. system, but that is controlled by the brain. I begin to realize that what's really going on, if you look at any parameter, it is actually fluctuating. It goes up for a period, it goes down for a period. So even body temperature, which is said to be you know, regulated, constant, uh, it actually changes during the course of the day, several degrees. And physiologists might say, well, it's, it's not much, it's pretty constant. But in fact, uh, since our metabolism depends on the temperature, uh, there's, a, there's a rather large, you know, 50% variation in our metabolic rate uh, with that relatively small variation in temperature. Ah. Oh, so, I never and, thought of that. Yeah, Sure. So your temperature changes a little bit, but that has exponential effects on processes, well, no, chemical it's, it, processes. It's called the Q10. So the, the, the rule is in biology, your uh, chemical reactions change by a factor of two to three with every 10 degree change in temperature. So a single degree or two degrees uh, is, is substantial. And if you think of paying your fuel bill that goes up 65% when you turn it up, it's, it's quite a lot. This became most important to me initially for blood pressure because standard blood pressure is about 100 systolic over maybe 70, 60, or 70 diastolic. And doctors will tell you, well, this is your blood pressure. It's right. 100, it's 110, it's 120. And it was established pretty early uh, after World War II. People did studies on health 
and they realized that chronically high blood pressure that is above 130 or 140 systolic was a major cause of of pathology. That's what causes heart attacks. That's what causes strokes, uh, kidney damage, and so on. And it was also realized at the time that the people uh, with the highest blood pressures, chronically high blood pressure, was called hypertension, um, were the most stressed people. And that turned out to be uh, uh, African-Americans. And that's just no surprise any longer. But so the question was, what causes high blood pressure? And the standard ideas in, in medicine and in all the medical textbooks and taught in medical school is, well, we don't really know what causes hypertension. It may be that the kidney produces, uh, we eat too much salt and therefore the kidney doesn't excrete it well enough. And so there's too much salt water, basically too much volume in the blood, and that, that causes the pressure to so rise. So it's a kidney problem. Well, it, it was considered a kidney problem. The major leading people who studied hypertension attributed it to the kidney, and they attributed the preponderance of uh, hypertension among uh, African Americans as the genetic inheritance of their Yeah, something about problems. the African American body. Is, yes. is is disposing them to this hypertension. Exactly, exactly. But it turned out, if you look at the parts of Africa where African Americans were transported from, from 1619 on, um, they don't have high blood pressure. And in the Caribbean, where, there are, where some of those Africans ended up, there's more high blood pressure than in Africa, but it's not anything like in the U.S. What, what about diet? Well, that, that's a standard idea, is that we, eat, we all eat too much salt. Okay. Well, we now understand that, um, that the brain also controls. It, it controls the kidney. It controls the blood vessels that, whose constriction would raise the pressure. It controls the heart rate and force, also contributes to high, elevating pressure. And all of these factors, it also controls um, how much salt we eat. It <laughs> controls our appetite for salt. Indeed. So all of these factors are controlled by the brain, and therefore the brain is really the the source of raising the pressure. So when I saw that, and I saw that our pressure goes up and down during the day, and every every mental event changes the pressure one way or the other. For example, if you doze in the afternoon, your pressure goes down. If, if somebody startles you, uh, your brain predicts that there's danger, your pressure goes up. They talk about it in doctor's offices. They take the first pressure. Good doctors will take a second pressure later on after you've right. settled down that's a little right. bit. That's right. At night, during sleep, uh, we have a, a diurnal rhythm of our blood pressure, and so our blood pressure goes way, way, way down during sleep, and then the next day it goes up to support your daily activities, maybe up into the uh, hypertensive range. When Joe Iyer and I realized this, we, we, we realized that actually the idea of homeostasis uh, it is not right, and it's 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 not the body independently regulating itself. Uh, it's it's set by the brain, and the reason is it's a much more efficient way to predict what is going to be needed than to correct the errors, because you can't predict perfectly. There will be errors, and you certainly need to correct them. There's a ton of homeostatic error correcting mechanisms, but they are sort of auxiliary mechanisms, and they're not the primary core part of regulation, which is predictive. So would you say that one one sort of rock-bottom way to characterize the difference between homeostasis and allostasis is that homeostasis is correcting after the fact... Yes, sort of, exactly. sort of responding... That's right. It's, it's closing the barn door after the horse is <laughs> gone. Okay. <laughs> Trying to close uh, the barn door. Yeah, and it, yeah. it's pretty good, but, um, you know... Uh, so, for example... Prevent hyperthermia when, when, when you, your body senses it's too cold. There are a lot of mechanisms to uh, warm you. You shiver. Yeah. Um, you move toward a warmer place. You put on clothing. But you the huddle. Be- you huddle. You cuddle. But the best thing is to realize you're going out into the cold and put on a jacket before you leave. Yeah. You know? And if you're going into the desert to hike, it, once you get there and you get thirsty, your body feels that th- there's an error it needs to correct by uh, drinking water, but you have to have remembered, you have to have anticipated this by bringing the water with you. Or certainly you're going to be better off. 
Yeah, well, you you will be yeah. dead if you yeah. if you didn't, you know. And I, so uh, I've come close to that condition. Yeah, yeah I have too. I yeah. went into the Grand Canyon one time with not enough water, and it was just, it was difficult. Yeah. So Alastase is about predicting. So when Joe Iyer and I published a couple of papers about this predictive sort of regulation and and the importance of the brain, it wasn't making a whole lot of headway uh, against the standard idea of homeostasis. So we, we, we thought, well, we need, it. we need a new term, really, to describe this new thought about how regulation occurs. Homeostasis is, is from the Greek words, stability through constancy. Is, that's it. Yeah. Stability through constancy. Sameness. Sameness. So I consulted a professor of Greek philosophy, who was, I happen to know. Stroke of genius, by the uh, way. Well, yeah. <laughs> Fairly obvious. Always go to the, the Greek. Yeah. yeah. I explained to him... The issue, which is we're looking for a term to describe stability through through change, and he said, "Oh yeah, well that's fine." Uh, allostasis. So he he made actually made up the term allo meaning other. Other. Okay. So stability through through other through. I mean, it may be not the best word, but I've I've tried that's to couple perfect. that over the years perfect. to prediction. So yeah. I, I say it's allostasis is a model of predictive regulation. Predictive regulation of the physiological systems of the body. That's right. In response to environmental demands. Exactly. Exactly. Or environmental, immediate environmental demands, or historical demands that you're that are in your head. You know that you know you carry certain precepts that you inherited from your parents, who inherited from their parents. I came from a family of. Russian Jews, and they uh, they were always on the lookout for being uh, uh, victims of a pogrom. So they were very cautious, and they sure. transmitted that. And uh, so they taught me to predict to predictively look, you know, who I was dealing with. Or you talk to any African American male in the United States, exactly, and uh, watch their blood pressure. I bet if there's a policeman nearby. That's right. So and and all of the African American. Males I know uh, have had the experience of DWB, driving while black, and being stopped uh-huh. for that. We adopted this idea of allostasis, and uh, it was criticized for being an unnecessary. We don't need a new word for this. It's all it's a same, fancy word for the same thing. But but actually, over the several no, decades, that's... it's uh, made some progress. Scientifically, it's inefficient. And it opens windows for confusion. If you're always talking about a thing, a phenomenon that you don't have a word for, right? you know, a specific word for it. Every single iteration of discussion, That's you right. have to talk about yeah. what it is. Right. So I, I think it's a brilliant term. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, and it adds so much. I mean, I think about all these phenomena that I've known about over the years. You, you mentioned body temperature. I've thought a lot about body temperature because I worry about in my own research, how social relationships help us manage our metabolic cost of living, right? Right. You know, if someone can help me lift the table up the stairs, I'm going to burn a lot fewer calories moving that table. And I might avoid hurting my back and scuffing the walls too. Right. When it comes to body temperature, the thing that's been really interesting to me is that there is a relatively narrow window. If you, you know, in, in terms of temperature per se, if you go sure. too cold, you die. And if you go too hot, you die. Right. Particularly the exactly. brain. But we don't have a temperature regulation organ. Right. Right. There's no, there's no heart like structure whose only job is to regulate our temperature. Right. So we have all of these different redundant right. strategies. Right. And what has fascinated me about them and what I don't have a good way to explain without the contributions you've made to how we understand predictive regulation is how all these strategies are hierarchically organized by cost. Right. Right. That's right. The least costly thing is to go, Hmm, I've innovated a weather report. Right. Right. I can listen, you know, I, the the, the human race, I can listen to the weather. It's going to be cold today. So I'll put on an extra coat. Right. Right. And yeah, the, the cheapest thing is to put on, a jacket. Uh, yeah. The next thing, the cheapest thing is to uh, to shiver. Uh, we have a kind of fat in our body that's called brown fat, yeah. which, uh, which when we burn produces mainly heat. 
And, of course, that all <clears throat> costs more food. And the more food we need, the more in, in the old days, we would have to go find and be exposed to danger and finding it and so on. Now, now we just need to go to the supermarket, which is sort of a problem, really, in a way. I mean, it's very convenient, but it's uh, sort of less satisfying in a way. I yeah. Think. Well, there's satisfaction. We're getting, I want to get to that in a minute. But first, I want to understand a little bit better how allostasis, this, this amazing uh, innovation that we share with lots of critters in order to efficiently anticipate what our body needs to do to meet demands, whatever it is, perceived memories, whatever it is, how can that gift, how can that make us sick? One of the aspects that makes allostasis and control by the brain very efficient is that it permits trade-offs uh, yeah, within the body. For example, uh, when we exercise intensely, we raise our need for oxygenated blood, and the, and the heart pumps more blood to the lungs, gets oxygen, ships it out to the body. But it can only, it can only increase its cardiac output by a certain factor. We actually need uh, more blood than the heart can actually in increase. And so what happens is that in times of need for a lot of blood, the kidney can sort of shut down its demand for blood. Or the, uh, the gut, which requires a lot of blood during periods of digestion, can shut down. And that extra blood can be used to fuel the muscles and serve the muscles that are needed for the exercise. When we stop exercising, the cardiac output can fall. Then blood is rerouted to the kidney and the gut and so on to resume their functions. Our skin can uh, sacrifice a lot of blood flow except that we need blood to our skin to cool. Uh, if our body in exercising is uh, raising the temperature, then we have to root uh, blood, blood to the, the skin. skin. And uh, so sometimes this works great. Other times the demands are in conflict. So, for example, if we try to exercise in the hot sun after eating a full meal, there's not enough blood to glow around. Something has to give. And uh, the, the regulatory system is arranged hierarchically, so the most important part is to protect the brain, protect the brain's oxygen, protect its temperature. And so what happens is, first of all, we, we become nauseous and we, we lose our meal. That solves the problem. Uh, and we, uh, we faint, and so we lie down, and so the, 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 there's less demand on pumping blood against gravity and so on. This is regulated by the brain, and this is part of allostasis. Suppose we didn't have a brain to make these trade-offs. Well, then what we would need is a much larger heart, more lung capacity, more blood vessels, and it would, it would increase the size of our power plant, basically. they need more of a reservoir. That's right. right. We would, that's right. So you, you, and so by being able to have these trade-offs, you can have a smaller reserve and you can have a smaller body, which you can maintain with uh, with less fuel, basically. This capacity for trade-off, of course, has to be regulated. And I mean, the kidney doesn't know under what condition it can sacrifice blood or, or needs it back, but the, the brain knows the overall context and therefore does this regulation and it has all the right connections to uh, put a traffic light to the kidney and, a, uh, and to the, uh, into the gut and boost, boost output to the brain. It seems like it's a nice way of avoiding, you know, the, the homunculus problem of, you know, little men in the brain making decisions all the way down, right? There's right. Lots of different components that the brain is monitoring That's and paying right. attention to. Exactly. And depending on prevailing demands, some will, will be more active than others, and right. that causes the downstream exactly. switching. Exactly. And, it, I mean, it's very complicated, and I think right now, people who are studying physiology, this is, this is a core problem of how, how is this all coordinated, which parts of the brain are involved. And, and as you know, uh, there's a lot of interest now in the anterior insula as a, as a cortex, as a mm -hmm. source of integrated this material information to yes. send it to the front Multiply frontal Multiply redundant. Lobe. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, well, yeah. first of all, I just want to take a moment to recommend to anyone listening that 
you at least take a peek at one of Peter's books. We're going to talk about both of them, but one is called Principles of Neural Design. And what what I'm thinking of right now is Peter and uh, Simon Laughlin. Simon Laughlin, um, they they diagram some of these central to peripheral systems in simple organisms early early right. on, right. and so you can really see how this works chemically, electrically, physically, um, you know, with pressure and things like that. Almost the way you would you could observe cogs in a in a me- mechanical you know in, in a device where you turn a lever and the cogs move. Of course, it gets, as Peter said, much more complicated than that as you go. But it's so useful to see it in action in a simple organism. So yeah, so this is uh, another point that I meant to make. The first bacteria that evolved. Uh, at the beginning of life uh, were called cyanobacteria, and they were in the ocean. Uh, They were the originators of allostasis, a predictive regulation in the form of a molecular clock. They evolved three proteins to interact in a certain way that would keep time. And why why would a bacterium in the ocean need to keep time? Well, because the bacterium has to replicate its DNA and then divide into two bacteria. So DNA replication is very vulnerable to, uh, to ultraviolet light. These DNA molecule absorbs ultraviolet light, which causes mutations and, and breaks the DNA. And so uh, it was very important for their survival to be able to uh, know when the sun would be up and when it would be down and to, to replicate their DNA in the dark. And so that was, that was really the first form of predictive regulation. What happened was it, it was a very effective clock. And once it evolved, maybe three billion years ago, all subsequent organisms had a clock very, very similar to this, to this molecular clock. The first organisms that gave rise to bilateral organisms, that is, you know, organisms that had paired arms, legs, ears, eyes, and so on, bilaterian worm, it was a worm, and it had a brain in the front of the body, because that was, if you're moving forward, that's where you want your sense organs, because that's efficient to keep the wires short. At the core of the first brain was a, a clock, and all subsequent organisms that this worm gave rise to insects and crustaceans and snails and ultimately to uh, fish and amphibians and reptiles and, and uh, mammals. And they all have this clock in the front of their brain. And in mammals, it's called the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's a special little set of nerve cells at the base of the brain that keeps our clock. And you'd think, well, that's, that, that, that's what wakes us up in the morning, lets us go to sleep at night. That's what gets messed up when we cross time zones and so on. But it's very powerful in regulating our, our metabolism predictively because it's efficient when we go to sleep that we don't need to mobilize energy for moving around. So that's, that's the time to use our metabolism to rebuild uh, our bodies, to to make new muscle, to make repairs, um, all, all, all sorts of things, to to straighten out your brain, to remember the s- things out, that you need. Clean out, clean out the brain. And yeah, and make new synapses yeah. to, to firm up your memories and so on. And that's what happens when we're sleeping. And then in the morning, uh, it's time to do the opposite, is to mobilize your energy metabolism and stop all of this uh, repair stuff. It's it's a very profound effect on our chemistry. So, for example, um, your heart muscle is made of cells, and at night there's something six to seven hundred different proteins in your heart that are under this diurnal control. And so, some of them increase, some of them decrease. And for example, the one that surprised me most is that there's a there's two kinds of sodium channel in the heart. One is uh, serves best most efficiently when the heart is beating rather fast. 
And there's another kind that's more adapted to when the heart is beating rather slowly. And so at night, as you go to bed, the slow channel is swapped in to the membrane and the, uh, the fast channel is swapped out. And this reverses uh, in the morning. And this is one reason probably why it's pretty common to, to have a heart attack if you're going to have one uh, at, around dawn. And that's when these, yeah. these, all of this metabolism is shifting. Yeah, I, you know, I had a heart attack. Yes. And um, my heart is mostly, almost 100% recovered. But I've learned, talking to my cardiologist, that it's when my heart it gets into a resting state. Uh-huh. That's when I start having some weird issues. Yeah. And he, he accidentally created some poetry by saying, Jim, your heart doesn't like to rest. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. All of the cells in the body uh, n- undergo these sorts of changes, some more than others, some more proteins than others. Um, and, I mean, your liver completely switches its metabolism at night and your fat cells and your gut and so on. And it turns out that this molecular clock, which started in cyanobacteria, exists in all of our cells. And the job of the brain clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, is to sort of synchronize them. They're not all, I mean, they don't all turn off and on at exactly the same time. And they have different time courses and so on. But it's, so each cell has some ability to predict uh, its allostatic needs. We, we would say its, it's need to vary uh, across the time of day. And the, and the job of the suprachiasmatic nucleus is to synchronize these. So it's, it's allostatic mechanisms all the way down. All the way down, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How can these allostatic predictive mechanisms make us sick? Or is that even the right question? Well, I, I mean, I, well, it's a fair. I mean, any question is a fair question. There are no stupid questions, um, but I don't. I think the answer is I don't think that the mechanisms make us sick. The mechanisms. I mean, the mechanisms of your car don't make your car break down. It's that they, they, the weather. they are very. They are vulnerable in various ways to being you know messed with. Okay, so if you don't. Uh, put oil in your crankcase, your motor is going to freeze up. You know, uh, if you don't check your tires, you're going to end up with a flat tire, uh, and, and so on. So there are many. If you don't replace the brake linings, they're going to fail. One of the things that happens is, uh, in the course of life, we have many mechanisms to increase our effort and and our attention and our alertness and so on, and um, and those go up and down. If they're chronically elevated, there's there's uh, there's more demand on them than there is replenishment, and so for example, it's 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 quite clear if you if you uh, have a normal average uh, blood pressure, which is around average blood pressure, arterial blood pressure in humans is about a hundred millimeters of mercury. That's the pressure that people who live as hunter gatherers. Uh, foragers in, in, in sort of small communities and don't work too hard and don't you know get too excited that's their normal blood pressure and it doesn't rise with age old people have this blood pressure as as well as young in the US blood pressure uh, in children starts to rise when they leave home and go to school and it continues to rise so that by graduation from high school, about 25% uh, of uh, young people have blood pressure in the hypertensive range. What happens? Well, if, if somebody has their average blood pressure not at 100, but say 160, I mean, it's pretty high, basically the other parts of the body adapt to this high pressure so that the arterial vessels which experience this high pressure begin to thicken. Uh, hypertrophy and what's involved is really something it's an adaptation to life at high pressure just the way if you if you lift weights on a regular basis your your skeletal muscles get thicker your biceps grows you know so this is like the equivalent of lifting weights for your arterial vessels except that they're hollow and they sort of the center fills up with this muscle and other pathologies develop around this. You get cracks in your vessels and you get 
a de- deposition of uh, plaque, which clogs them up, and that, that's what causes heart attacks and strokes, one of the things. The problem isn't with the regulation. The problem is basically uh, living in ways that don't allow enough replenishment, recovery. Energy expenditure is called catabolism, breaking stuff down. Rebuilding it is called anabolism. And if you don't spend enough time in anabolism, rebuilding stuff, repairing stuff, then bad, bad, things, bad things happen. You know, I've uh, heard it referred to as weathering, sure. you know, weathering of the body. There's also this concept in epidemiology, I don't know if you've heard of it, called John Henryism, where not always black males, but black males are where you see it most predominantly where people cross social class when they, they, they leave a lower class and they join an upper class. Sure. They realize all of these benefits, but physiologically they often realize a terrible cost. Right. And it's just what you're talking about. Their bodies just fail after a while because it's too hard. Right. And, and in some studies, it, they even fail more than matched peers who didn't make the, the jump. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. I've often wondered about, there was a, the famous baseball player, Jackie Robinson, who was the first uh, African-American to join the major leagues. And he, he died, he, had, he got diabetes and heart, heart disease very, very early and uh, died very young. I, and I, I, I think that it was probably his health probably suffered from this strain, yeah. the chronic strain of being Jackie Robinson, you know. So it's funny, I, I asked, how does allostasis make you sick? And it was, and I see why you paused, because it's not allostasis that's making you sick. Allostasis is, is keeping you alive uh, sure. in the face of challenges that are making you sick. That's right. Circumstances. And, that yeah, and we, you know, we can we can meet the challenges, uh, many challenges, but um, when they become chronic, then they then damage occurs, and what you have is premature disease of pathology of, of many many kinds. And the question is, who who dies of what? People say, well, doesn't genetics play a role? That's often a question I get. Well, to some extent, yes, things run in different families, but the point is. Those genetics that really determine the distribution of these problems. Who gets what? You know, if we're all under a chronic strain, some people will feel it in their hearts. Other f- people will feel it in their their uh, mental state, and and so on. So, predisposition, I think, is less important than living, you know, a, a reasonable life. You know, one of my colleagues, Eric Turkheimer, has looked at how even the effect of genetics is dependent upon your circumstances. So for example, if you come from a low income, you know, oppressed group, your genetics isn't accounting for that much of your outcomes and a lot of variables. Sure. If you're in a very affluent group with everything taken care of, all of a sudden your genetics has room to express itself. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. My, my example of that is uh, the trade for being tall. Okay. Uh, oh, the correct. basketball yeah. player uh, that I like to talk about, uh, Sean Bradley, he's quite famous. He was seven foot six and he's way out on the, on the height curve. And it turns out that the geneticist did check out his, his genome and he had a, a sort of an average number of genes for, for short. And of course, the genes for this trait, uh, there are many, many genes with small effect. For tall, he had about 200 excess genes for tall, and that's what made him tall, but he was well fed. And, and, and if he was starved growing up, he would have the same genes, but he would not have reached uh, seven foot six. Right, because that wouldn't have been smart for the body to do. Yeah, well, it wouldn't would have, have been, been possible. Actually. It wouldn't have been possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, w- it wouldn't have been possible, but it also wouldn't have been, it would have... Not adaptive. It wouldn't have been adaptive, yeah. which is why it wouldn't have been possible, yeah. right? Yeah. It would just be a waste. It would kill him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's the body's... Yeah, you couldn't support more growth, yeah. One of the things that you write about is learning and how 
this predictive regulation is applied to accessing items on our shopping list, you might say, on the brain's shopping list, things that, that, are, that are good for us, you know, food, water, mates, comfortable situations, interesting stuff accomplishments i mean i'm expanding the list beyond what many would but you make a, a a pretty compelling case that the list is expandable in that way what is the role of dopamine in this process uh this allostasis process in learning and 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 our life is that a fair question uh it's a yeah, it's a, ba- a very good basic question yeah. sure okay this has to do with how uh, the brain if the brain uh, is is tasked with providing resources to the body, the brain has to get the body to go do stuff. Yeah. Okay? And um, it's been studied in bacteria. I mean, bacteria uh, will feed where this food sort of peters out as it gets eaten up. The bacteria begin to move, and they have flagella that send them off. And the bacterium doesn't have a brain. It's just a single tiny cell. So it has to figure out where the next food is. And it does so by sort of tumbling and if it happens accidentally to tumble into an area where there's a higher concentration of a signal that says food it keeps going in that direction for a while if, if so somehow it learned well no well so it has to learn what what a bacterium has to remember its m- memory is uh, is this signal here higher than the one that it just came from so its memory is only a few seconds long which makes sense because a bacterium that's in good shape is dividing and so it's its own existence may only be 15 minutes and so a few seconds is fine but once you get to uh to a say a worm this this first bilateral worm it's a say a millimeter a couple millimeters long it, it's eating it's actually eating the bacteria and so when it, it's exhausted the bacteria here it has to find a a new spot or when the the uh, temperature is unsuitable there, finds a different spot. When the uh, pH, the acidity of the medium is not quite right, it, it, goes, it needs to find a better spot. And so the brain of a, of a worm, of this little worm that I'm talking about, the C. elegans, for example, I mean, it, it was a descendant of this earlier bilateral worm, but it's, it's a very it's highly... It's a nematode, st- right? It's a nematode, and it uh, lives in the soil, typically, when it's not in some laboratory. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's about two millimeters long, and it, it is comprised of 900 cells, very precisely. I think, I think it's 900. Um, its brain, of those 900, is 302 cells. Okay, so it has tremendous investment in this brain. I mean, it's a third of its total cells. The brain of the nematode has been studied very thoroughly. And, and what it has, one of the things it has is a circuit that drives it to, uh, to search, to, to move. And uh, so it's, it's constantly moving around and searching for either food or a better, better pH or more mates, company, and so on. And uh, so when it finds one of these things accidentally, unpredicted by its brain, this is a circuit that gives it a little pulse of the neurotransmitter dopamine. And the effect of the dopamine is to essentially signal, okay, pause here, this is a good spot, and you can relax, you know. And, um, and so the, the worm stops and exploits whatever resource it has been delivered to and for a while, and then this searching circuit reasserts itself to satisfy the next need. And each time that the organism uh, encounters something that was, is positive but unpredicted, it gets this pulse of dopamine. One of the f- effects of the pulse of dopamine is to teach the, the circuit, the, the brain, that this was a good spot, you should either stay here or return here. You know? So there's some, some amalgam of properties about that spot that it learns about. Yeah, or something specific. Yeah. Or something but, specific. Yeah, yeah. But, but the point is the searching for resources and the remembering of these resources was completely fundamental and was in the first brain, and it involved dopamine. Well, 
when in evolution, organisms reach a good solution that's really effective, these are retained. It's called being conserved. And so it turns out that this system for rewarding a randomly found something with a, with a reward is, is mathematically the most effective, optimal way to learn. This was a, a rule that was discovered mathematically by uh, Sutton and Bartow. It's in all the textbooks, and, and it's called reward prediction error. And when we get to, to animals and higher animals, we're, we're familiar with uh, that the dopamine uh, signal, when we get it, you get a pulse of satisfaction, a little pulse of relief. You can stop. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I got my grant in. Okay, I got my... Your blood pressure can go down a little bit. Your blood pressure can go down, and uh, you can relax a little bit. Of course, it doesn't last very long. I know. Because because we need it to go on to the next issue. You get your grant done, but then it's time to go cook dinner. Or you, 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 know, you, you have other responsibilities. You have other needs. If you're warm enough, you, you'll still have to find something to drink. If you're have water, you still have to find food, uh, and so on. I, I, no, I noticed that Freud, um, in his last book uh, called Civilization and His Discontents, he says happiness is, is uh, by design uh, something that's fleeting because we only always need to go on to the next thing. So he, he uh, this may be one of the it's few things book. he got right. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and there, there are many examples in literature of... of uh, this and, and so we we're never satisfied really, and uh, uh, because we we uh, we adapt to whatever good thing we found and, and need to go on to the next thing. And I, I like uh, Goethe's as a line says, uh, "Nothing, nothing is uh, so depressing as a succession of fair days." <laughs> I'm somewhat surprised that I've actually never heard the term allostasis before because I think I experience it. You know, I I definitely know the temperature fluctuates a ton throughout the day. If you're ever trying to get pregnant or at least know when your ovulation is, taking your basal body temperature every single day. So that's, I just can't believe I never had a word for that. The, The fact that the body is changing in order to keep stability. Yeah. And you know, there's there's really two issues for me. One is that there's this medical idea when we think about solving a medical problem, as he says in the interview, you know, the solutions to those medical problems are really, really close to the problem itself. So we right. think of simple mechanisms and that leads to sort of sort of hydraulic models of things. And this is where homeostasis comes from. Right. You want it to stay you want the measurement, the reading of the thing in your blood or whatever it is to be in this narrow band. And if it's not in that narrow band, you add some medication or you zets it with something and it puts it back in that band. You know, even medicine writ large is not oriented toward thinking about the body as an adaptive system, the point of which is to flexibly explore the world and, and respond to prevailing demands. The idea that, for example, the heart is actually not just a blood pump. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a flexibly shaped by natural selection Mm -hmm. device for shifting your body's ability to focus on a math problem in one case or escape a predator on foot in another case. You know, play basketball, uh, ride a bike, sleep do all of these things in some sense each one of those things requires a different kind of pump and so the heart has to be all of those things and that means that the the point of having a heart is to be changeable right it's really interesting and extremely applicable as well i'm a coffee drinker in the sense that I like a coffee drink now and then. I am not a morning coffee person. Caffeine has a really strong impact on me. And I hear all the time from people that, oh, you know, they have to have their coffee like right when they wake up. But there's actually a natural cortisol spike that happens like within 40 minutes or so of being awake that keeps you up for the day. It's when your body says, okay, we're not gonna go back to sleep. This isn't just me kind of, you know, turning over in bed. 
I'm up for the day. I'm alert. And that makes you alert. But if you drink coffee before that, your, your cortisol spikes because of the caffeine and then will drop again when you have run out of that. Oh yeah, cortisol is a perfect example of how the body is designed to be in different physiological states depending on the situation, the diurnal moment. You know, I've had a cold recently. And one of the things that anyone with a cold will know is that commonly people feel worse in the evening. And that's because cortisol is an anti-inflammatory and your cortisol levels mm, are dropping yep. by the evening so that you can go to sleep. And so you feel more crummy because you got less anti-inflammatory activity going right. on in your body. Yeah, it, it's just wild to me that I've accepted the, the concept of the word homeostasis. Yeah even though I've very much lived the allostasis, like very consciously, that, that has been a huge part of my life. Well, and even more mind-blowing to me is that allostasis is still a concept that is woefully underappreciated in medicine, in clinical psychology and psychiatry, mm. in social policy, in the design of our workspaces, in the way that we design schools and education, the way right. that we live our ordinary lives. Um, the more we can start treating ourselves like the animal that we are, yeah. the more these things will work for us instead of sort of against us. Yeah, absolutely. Part two of this episode will be released in two weeks. Don't miss it. This is where things get very tangible to our everyday lives. We'll get to hear Peter's answer to the question. Why do we try so hard to make life easier? That's right. Folks, the music of Circle of Willis is written and performed by Tom Stoffer and his band, The New Drakes. For more information on how to purchase their music, go to our website, circleofwillispodcast.com. You can also find all of our old episodes on the website. If you haven't already, subscribe to Circle of Willis wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Twitter and Instagram for more updates. Circle of Willis, human stories of the science that shapes our world.